All right, I want to take a few minutes and provide a uh, overview of the UML, uh, sort of a 30,000 foot view. Uh, the book does a pretty good job of talking about the individual uh, individual diagrams, but it's useful sometimes to see how all these diagrams work together to uh, communicate uh, the uh, design of a system. A uh, couple things we want to get uh, cleared up right away is that uh, it is UML is just a collection of notations. Uh, they capture and express uh, aspects of the des software design, um, but we have to keep in mind a, a few things. One is that the UML is just the notation, it's not a technology. It doesn't do anything for you, it's just a collection of icons and uh, standard ways of organizing them to communicate something about the software. Uh, it's also not a methodology. We'll talk about methodology in a minute, but basically it is just the notation. Uh, methodology requires a couple other parts. So it doesn't, we, we really don't know how to go about using UML. UML doesn't say how to use it. It basically provides some rules of ways you shouldn't use it, but there's really no one way to use UML. And so in that sense, it's not a methodology. And if you can just keep in mind that it's all about communication, you'll be good to go. Just realize that there's these uh, uh, icons, that mean something, uh, and if you keep in mind what those things mean, uh, you can use them to communicate a variety of things, not just uh, software design. I use it for meta modeling. Uh, I use it for just many times. There's relationships that I need to capture between things. It's a useful uh, set of tools. All right. So what is a methodology? A methodology it consists of three parts. It has a representation, it has a process, and it has heuristics. Uh, I put, included heuristics just so uh, we have a complete definition, but we're not going to talk about those. We're going to focus on the representation and process. And so the representation, uh, three common forms would be text, uh, would be mathematics, and of course, the last would be diagrams. So most systems are specified using a combination of these. Uh, some things you can't uh, just need to be written down and... and in text. Uh, some things are easier to express if you have any kind of calculations, algorithms that are mathematical in nature, useful to use mathematics to describe them, and of course diagrams to give you a visualization of the, the uh, this complex thing that is the software. A process on the other hand is really what tells, you know, while we have all these notations and ways to represent the system, we have to know how about go about getting them in place. And so that's what a process does, is it identifies the activities that are going to be occurring. It tells us in what order we need to do them. It also tells us what we're going to generate along the way. And so the process is what tells us how to use the UML to describe um, the design of the, so the software. Uh, again, UML doesn't come with any preconceived idea of how it's going to be used. Uh, basically, it's the set of notations that enable you to do the to uh, to uh, to capture what it is you want to capture. <clears throat> the most uh, traditional process it was what's called a linear model, and by far the most popular linear model was the waterfall model, and that was used pretty extensively through the 70s and early 80s. Uh, basically, what you did was start with the requirements, go gather them, talk, you know, however you go about doing that, get the requirements defined. From the requirements, you would then produce a design of the system. Uh, from once you have the design in place, you would do the implementation, the actual coding. Uh, once the system's coded, you would go through a verification stage where you ensure that the, the system that you built does indeed meet the requirements. <clears throat> once you're satisfied there, you would deploy it, uh, put it into production, and once it goes into production, you're going to enter the maintenance phase where you're dealing with uh, bug fixes and things like that, just keeping the system up and running. The, this approach isn't uh, should be familiar to you. Uh, probably when you learn how to write an essay, uh, back in, I don't know, 7th or 8th grade, you went, you learned a similar process. Um, in this case, you would start with your brainstorm, get all your ideas together, you put them in together to an outline. From the outline, you would then write your paper, uh, proofread it, and submit it to the instructor. Um, my guess is you really didn't go into a maintenance phase. But the idea of this flow um, it makes sense. I know you've seen it before. So, conceptually it made sense. Uh, it, did, it does work to some degree, but it does have problems. Uh, in terms of the pros, the nice part about it is you understand the system early. So from the, once you complete the requirements phase, you know everything you need to know about the system. So at that point, you're good, you're good to go. And as you go through the phases, you only enter the next phase when you're completely done with the one before it. So when you go into implementation, you know your design is complete. That's the, the theory behind the model. The problem is that when you're going through this, if your project gets terminated early, you may not have anything to show for it. You may not have any working prototype. You might have the requirements defined. You might have some design, but you're really not going to have any system to speak of. In terms of the actual um, execution of the waterfall model, a little bit difficult to do. Uh, 
uh, primarily because you're going to assume that you can get all your requirements correct up front. And that's not going to be the case. Your requirements will change. Uh, mistakes are going to happen in, the, in this flow. It makes it very difficult. Uh, you spend a lot of time doing your requirements. If you don't catch an error uh, until you're deep into the implementation or verification, it's a lot of work to go, uh, re to go back and fix all these things. Um, so it's difficult to actually execute uh, perfectly anyway. And it also doesn't reflect the way we work. So if you think about how you wrote essays, you probably were forced to do the brainstorming outline, whatever. Most of us now don't do that. We probably sit down and start writing something. Um, and we flush it uh, out as it goes along, a little more of an organic process. And that's what we find organizations doing today. They're adopting what's called an iterative model. In an iterative model, <clears throat> you go through uh, smaller phases um, and you're slowly developing the system over time. So you do a little planning, figure out what requirements you want to tackle, come up with a design that, and implementation that meets that, verify it works, and then go, go, go grab a couple more requirements and keep going. So over time, your system is getting, um, as you go through these iterations, is getting larger and larger. Ultimately, you'll have the system you want. Um, so the benefit is here that you have a working model early. So right off the get-go, you're actually writing code and you're getting something to work. Uh, this really models well the idea that requirements are going to change by tackling them a little bit at a time. You learn about the system. Um, you can show the customers the prototype. They can give you feedback. So in the end, you'll have a system that, you know, you won't, your requirements will be a little more solid by the time you get to the end because everything, any of the, some of the issues, a lot of the issues that could have occurred have been worked out as you've been going along. Um, and the process reflects the way people work. Uh, that's really nice because they go in and um, when you think this way, it's like, okay, I got the requirement. Here's how I might tackle that. Let me go try to see if it works. So you're actually uh, reflecting the way people want to work. Um, it, on the negatives, since you don't, you're assuming the requirements are going to change, you don't know when the system, you don't know what the system is going to be in the end. You have a vague notion, but you don't really know. And because of that, you don't naturally have a stopping rule. You can't say that, all right, I'm gonna, I've got these 50 requirements, and once I implement it, I know I'm done. Um, as you're going along, your requirements are going to change. You're going to get new ones. You're going to drop some. Uh, so at looking ahead, you really don't know the direction that this particular project is going to take. Uh, that makes planning more challenging. Um, to be able to plan and you have, make sure you have the right resources and you're allotting the right amount of time is difficult um, to plan an entire project up front when you don't know what kind of uh, things you're going to get encounter along the way. Uh, people are doing it successfully, so obviously it is possible. Uh, and it is a really nice way to work. It's just more of, uh, you know, you have to spend a lot more time on the planning to make sure you've got everything accounted for. All right. So so if we have a process, the process tells us what we need to generate. Um, what kind of things can UML provide? Well, it can help us capture what the software is supposed to do. Uh, it can have it help us capture um, what the entities are in the system, in the software. So we refer to them as classes. So what are the classes in the software? How do they relate to each other? Um, at runtime, how do instances of these classes interact? How do the objects uh, interact? Um, how are the, uh, when we actually compile things, they go into binaries? Um, how many binaries we're going to have? Which binaries talk to each other? Um, how do they, you know, are there some relationships we can define? Uh, and then we also have, um, when we deploy this thing, the binaries have to go run somewhere, and so we want to know what uh, nodes we have in our system and what binary is located on, on which node. And so we can capture all that. So in terms of what the software is supposed to do, we have a use case diagram, which captures the relationship of the actors in the system, and so the actors being those little stick figures, uh, what are their goals? The use cases represent goals. Uh, so we see that relationship. And we can also see that there are relationships between, between use cases that can occur, and you'll learn more about those as the semester rolls along. In terms of what the entities are in the system and how they relate, we have class diagrams. So we have the, those rectangles represent classes, and the arrows going between them represent different types of relationships. Um, you'll learn a lot about those. Uh, we can communicate a lot of information, or not communicate a lot of information, as the case may be, using these class diagrams. Or uh, by far, some of the they can be very vague. Um, just be, as I'll mention later, but when you look at the diagram, um, we see button manager there. We see it has operations. We don't know if there's more operations. Uh, we don't see anything about attributes, so we don't know how many attributes it has. So when we look at a uh, diagram, we're only guaranteed uh, what we see. And so um, in that sense, we have flexibility in what we want to show and what we want to communicate. Uh, sequence diagrams. Uh, once the classes in the system uh, give rise to, we instantiate them and get objects, and those objects uh, interact at runtime, and we can kind of capture that interaction using a sequence diagram. So we'll see the messages moving between um, objects. Uh, time runs down, uh, down vertically. So things that occur lower in the diagram occur. Uh, those messages are being sent later than the ones that are up at the top. 
um, capture a lot of you know loops and optional processing and things like that. But it's a really nice way to show how the interaction is taking place. Uh, component diagrams. Again, we know the components represent the binaries. These could be libraries or executables. Uh, they um, may have dependencies between them. Uh, here we see two components in the ball, the ball and socket notation. Uh, this represents a uh, the display manager having an interface and the clock mechanism needing that, and they're they're being connected through that interface. Not all not all your systems you develop will have interfaces, but um, we can have components that depend on depend on each other. And lastly, we have the deployment diagram, which consists of um, these cubes, which represent the uh, processors. You can also represent devices, and we'll see you know how components are deployed and what channel, what the communication channel or protocol is. Here we have a DMA, but it could have been TCAP, IP, or whatever. Okay, so it's great that we have all these different diagrams, um, but what's really nice is that we don't have to. A class diagram just doesn't doesn't just have to have classes on it. It can have uh, a diagram can have classes. It can have use cases. Everything we want. Um, so what's useful in that sense is we can create diagrams which help us produce uh, or um, identify traceability of requirements. Which means, uh, what is the if I make a change to a requirement, what is the impact uh, going to be on the overall system? So here we would start with a set of use cases. Uh, once we have the use cases, we would think of, we'd analyze them and come up with a set of classes that we need in our system. Um, each of these classes are defined because they support some use case. We won't have there's no point in creating a class that doesn't uh, get involved with meeting a requirement. Um, so we'll have those classes. We then would decide how those classes are going to be uh, compiled into these binaries, uh, libraries or executables, and ultimately where those thing those binaries are going to be deployed on what processors. So here we have a situation where I have a use case, say the second one in from the left. If I make a change there, I understand I can see that it, a change there might impact the first four classes um, starting on the left. Um, and since those four classes uh, are are the two component, the first two components use those first four classes, they would be affected. And because both of the pro both of the nodes um, depend on those first two components where we see that there are uh, problem um, they would be affected as well so we can see that we can trace from the requirement down through uh, deployment where uh, what a change in this requirement how that ripples through the system by far though the most common use of UML is using is being able to identify the use cases the requirements um, the part the classes that um, are involved in meeting that requirement and in fact, the interaction that takes place between instances of those classes to actually do meet the requirements. So what you'll find is you'll have these three things that provide closure. You'll have your use case, um, that'll give rise to these classes so you can make the connection there, and then you can create an interaction diagram that you can compare against the use case to see if you in fact did design the system correctly. So if you can look at the use case and look at the interaction and agree that they, um, that they are, well, and I observe that they agree, uh, you have met the requirement. Moving into the code, of course, we would go implement this, and then when we look at the code, we would go back to the interaction to make sure that um, our code actually meets the interaction, and then that interaction is meeting the use case, so we're good to go. But these would be the three things we want to focus on. I'll be sending out an example later in the semester um, that you know gives you a, a system with use cases, classes, interaction diagrams, and the source code. Um, we can, I'll probably get, uh, I think about midterm, we start talking about Java, so I'll start pushing that out roughly about then and we can use that as a as a common point of discussion. All right, so just to recap, um, keep in mind UML is about communication and that it's not a methodology or a techn technology, it's just a set of notations we can use to describe something, um, in this case software design, and uh, we're going to find that we need to use many, many diagrams as we go along. Um, if we have 50 classes, we're not going to put all 50 classes on the same diagram and show all the relationships between everything, it just would be, it'd be unreadable. So we would use a lot of different class diagrams. Um, to to capture that. And again, fundamentally, uh, if you walk away with nothing else today, uh, is to realize and keep in mind that what you see on a diagram is that's only what you're guaranteed. You're not guaranteed what you don't see. So you'll find in practice that if you have three or four class diagrams, the same class might appear in each one. And each time it appears, it's going to look a little bit different. And that is just the nature of UML. It's about communication. So you can't look at a diagram, see a class, let's say on a class diagram, and go, oh, that's all I need to know. There's a lot more to it than that. So don't make any assumptions about what's not there, but uh, definitely absorb what is there. So hopefully this provided some uh, useful value-added material from what the book provided. As always, if you have questions, shoot me an email.